Today we are hosting the 50th live webinar on orthopedic principles and our guest lecturer today is Dr. Philip Matthew. After getting inspired by the work of Paul W. Brand, Dr. Philip chose hand surgery to be his specialty of his choice and pursued higher surgical education in the United Kingdom. He's attached as senior lecturer to the Queen Mary's University MSc program, also an approach tutor for the British Society for Surgery of Hand Diploma course and also faculty for Queen's Hospital FRCS course. He currently serves as a consultant hand and wrist surgeon at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital NHS Trust. Today he's going to discuss about clinical examination of hand and wrist with respect to the fellowship exam. Over to you Dr. Philip Matthew. Good evening everyone. Thank you for joining in and more importantly thank you um, Professor Gopal for inviting me to give this talk. Um, please do stop me at any point if I'm running over time or I'm talking too fast. Um, I'll rely on the moderators to guide me on that. Okay, so kickstarting. Just a statement to say that a lot of the illustrations that I'm using in my slides are courtesy of Mr. Donald Samet, one of our hand surgery colleagues from um, Windsor, who's an amazing hand surgeon and is also an amazing artist. So for the format of the exam, you usually have intermediate cases which last about 30 minutes and in which you have roughly two cases, 15 minutes each. And it's important during these 15 minutes, you take five minutes for history, five minutes for clinical examination. And more importantly, when you finish, don't forget to summarize. You need five minutes for summary and discussion. Um, and then you have short cases, and there'll be usually an upper limb and a lower limb case uh, cases. And the upper limb, you usually get about three cases and five minutes each. And these are usually sort of bang, bang, bang. You're moving from one case to the next. Um, and you have a few seconds to remember everything that you've learned, put that into making a quick diagnosis, and also leave some time to discuss your treatment for that patient. One of the key things is to not worry about how badly or how well you did at the last station. Focus on the station you're at. So you can put all your effort into conveying whatever information you need. And it's very important that you focus on each step and go to the next and don't worry about what happened at the last station. It's important that you listen to what is being asked of you. Um, focus on the specific assessment, they may tell you demonstrate a particular test. In that point, don't start with history examination, everything, just focus on what they're telling you. And also important is to keep talking during the exam. Don't just be silent, even if you have no idea what's going on, just describe what you see. Even if you just describe, oh, it's a left hand, it's got a, a swelling or it's got some wasting, Talk about it and keep talking so you don't stop. And when you're doing a test, it's pretty important that you don't stop with, oh, I am going to do this test. Do it. And as you're talking, as you're doing the test, describe what you're doing. Because you lose a lot of time by saying, I am going to demonstrate this test. No, just go ahead, do the test and talk to them about what you found. It's good to have some things like a key, a coin, a pen and a pen torch in your hand, specifically for the hand exam, because they're useful, as I'll demonstrate as we go along. It's also important, the next slide's gonna be pretty busy, but it's also important to have a rough overview of what sort of conditions you're likely to get. Um, and then you can focus down on the problem. Is it a cartilage or synovial problem? Is it osteoarthritis? Is it post-traumatic? Is it inflammatory? Is it rheumatoid? Is it a nerve related problem? Um, is this a congenital problem? Is it connective tissue? Is it bone? Is it tendon? Is it ligament? And once you know roughly what sort of cases you're likely to get roughly, you then have an idea that when you see a short case, you can just hone in on what the problem is and talk about that particular problem, which buys you a lot of time. So the idea behind this um, few slides that are gonna come up in, in due course are to give you a systematic approach to a person with a hand problem. 
that comes to you in your exam, say you get something like this, how are you going to tackle it? How are you going to approach it? So here's the plan. The questions you ask yourself when you go in there are what am I looking at? As we talked about a few minutes ago, is it a skin lesion, a nerve injury, a vascular lesion? Is it a tendon problem? Is it a bone or joint problem? Is it congenital or is it a tumor? Um, and then once you've got a rough idea what you think it might be, just go down that route. How can I now focus further examination with specific tests that I know of so I can show the examiner that I know it. What if I get stuck and I've not yet figured out the problem? You just stop and just go back to the beginning again and start thinking, what have I missed? Have I missed a skin lesion? Have I missed a nerve lesion? Um, and oftentimes than not, once you do a systematic approach, you won't miss things. In the history side of things, um, specifically for the hand, remember to ask about age, handedness, what is their role in daily life? What do they do for a living? Uh, you may want to treat someone who plays a uh, clarinet or a flute who needs very fine um, use of his fingers to differently from someone who's a manual worker who's gonna be hitting it with a hammer all day long. How long have he, has he had the symptoms? And then things that you might ask, for example, like in a knee exam, you'd always ask, is, it inst is there any signs of instability? Same way with the wrist, you can get instability. Does the wrist give way? Um, is it just painful? Which is the predominant problem? Is pain the predominant problem? Is instability the predominant problem? If it's in instability, then you're looking at maybe a um, tendon that's a block thing or a ligament injury, as opposed to if it's pain, you're thinking more, maybe more arthritis because it's unlikely that they're going to put an acute injury for you in the exam. Um, ask if there's any history of clicking. Does the wrist click as it moves? Um, and one thing a lot of people forget in the hand side of thing is always to ask about hypermobility or examine bait and score to see if they're hypermobile because just because it's lax on one side doesn't mean that it's not lax on the other as well. So check both sides. Is there any history of recent trauma um, or maybe a year ago, six months ago? And what treatment has the patient had to date? You can always ask, have you had an injection? Have you had some splints? Have you had some hand therapy? So those are things that uh, people sometimes forget to ask. And these are all tick boxes that help you progress to the next step. The assumption is that you've passed the MCQs and hence know quite a lot of the theoretical stuff and the focus on the examination is on the examination in this section. And the idea is to develop a system to examine any case that comes your way in the hand and wrist section. So most orthopedic surgeons know of the sequence of look, feel, move and special test and that's a good way to go about examination in the hand as well. So in the look side, it's very important that you expose the patients to above the elbow so you can actually look at the joint above. You can miss subtle signs like psoriasis, that's a psoriatic patch, um, which you won't see unless you remove or get the patient to roll up the sleeves and say, can I see your elbows? So one of the first things I do is get them to do that so you can actually look at the elbows. Uh, you may miss an olecranon bursa. You may see a scar from an ulnar nerve decompression. All these are little clues that can point you towards what they may be wanting you to look for in the hand. Um, this is a case of mine where we did, uh, or this is a case where they've had a skin graft taken from the inside aspect of the elbow in a patient who had a dermofasciectomy for Dupuytren's disease. So unless you get them to roll up the sleeves and look for it, you're not going to see that scar there. And you may not even see some of the skin graft scars, which are so fine, specifically in the hands. Look for splints, walking aids, um, just like you would do for a hip and knee examination. They may have just taken off their wrist splint and placed it on the side of the table. So check, have they got a finger splint or a wrist splint lying nearby and comment on it. Um, look at the patient's nails. You may see subtle signs like pitting, which is a sign of psoriasis. 
and they may not have any other signs of psoriasis anywhere else. Um, so look for these subtle signs which can help you when you are looking at a patient's hands. Um, are all the fingers pointing where they should compare to the opposite side? Most fingers, when you do the cascade, should point roughly towards your scaphoid. Um, is one of the fingers pointing away from the rest of them, towards the rest of them? Is it rotated? Have a look at the nails end on, and that can give you an idea of whether there's any rotational deformity that you may miss otherwise as you get them to flex and straighten. Is there any Un overriding? Is there any underriding? And those are simple things you can do with just a cursory initial examination. Um, a lot of the wrist surgeons do wrist arthroscopies now, and these are through very, very small teeny weeny scars. So when you're looking on the wrist, when somebody with wrist pain, you've got to look for, you should know where the locations of the normal portals are, the three, four, the mid-carpal radial, the mid-carpal ulnar, four, five portals, and that's um, a rough approximation of where you'd see these scars. So look for them and say, well, he does look like he's got sc small scars of the wrist, which may be from a wrist arthroscopy. Dupatrons, um, so that's a pit where the skin's puckered in, and that's a nodule where it's elevated. So if you see these, talk about them, say that there are I, I can see a pit or more than one pit, or I can see nodules in the hand. Um, what a lot of people forget to talk about in, is the Garrett's pads, which are seen on the top of the knuckles. When you turn the, when, you, when someone sees Dupatron, you spend all your focus on this side, but don't forget to turn the hand over and look for any signs of Garrett's pads because they're um, useful pointers towards where the problem might be, that this is someone who's got stigmata of Dupatron's disease. And don't forget to comment that you'd like to complete by examining the foot and ask the patient if it's a male patient for perineas or Lederhose disease as well. Um, again, just as we're still on the look side, this is someone with uh, a rheumatoid hand. You can talk about the ulnar drift of the fingers that you've noticed. Um, the swelling over the MCP joints, possible subluxation of the MCP joints, which you'd like to examine further. And this is just someone with a lump in the hand. When you see a lump, go back to your medical school basics. Talk about size. Um, is it red? Is it hot? Is it um, soft? Is it cystic? And those are very simple things that you need to be able to talk about with respect to a lump anywhere. If you see wasting in the hand, this is a thing of muscle wasting here, you know that you're going to focus on a nerve examination first off because wasting the most commonest cause is a nerve problem or you could get it from atrophy because of disuse or from secondary disuse from arthritis or painful joint. When you get this degree of wasting, you're going to think, I'm going to start examining this patient's median nerve. And simple things, if you get the patient to hold the knuckles towards you, normally you should see a nice intermetacarpal gutter between the metacarpal heads. When the metacarpal gutter is lost, you mentioned that as there's loss of intermetacarpal guttering, this is usually seen in some type of inflammatory arthritis. Don't forget to mention, if you do see them, about Bouchard's nodes, which are these, which are seen in the proximal interphalangeal joints, or Herberden's nodes, which are seen in the distal interphalangeal joints. So this can, brings me on to your knowledge of where you normally see the distribution of arthritis. Osteoarthritis usually affects the DIP, PIP joints, and of course the CMC joints. Rheumatoid affects mainly the MCP joints and then the PIP. Pyrophosphate crystal arthropathy affects the distal radial ulnar joint, ulnar carpal joint, and the MCP joints alone, usually. Psoriatic arthropathy, the most common one, is distal interphalangeal joints first, followed by PIP and then less so MCPs. So look at the distribution. Where does it occur? Is it symmetrical? Symmetrical is usually 
inflammatory. If you've got both hands exactly the same or similar, they, it's, you're more likely to think of inflammatory arthritis. So if you get someone like this in the exam um, who's got this and you don't know where to start, a standard sort of terminology that you could start with would be something like, this is a generalized symmetrical polyarthropathy affecting mainly the PIP and DIP joints because the MCP gutters look reasonable with skin lesions suggestive of psoriatic arthropathy. So that's the start and that gives you a starting point with the conversation and then you can go on to the examination bits that you need to do. So moving on to the feel, just this is very important. This is a pass or fail an exam if you hurt the patient. So you have to be very clear when you're examining the patient, you're looking at the patient as well. You're so stressed out and nervous by what's going on in the exam and what you need to do. I need to make sure I do all the 100 examinations that I've thought of. In that process, don't forget to look at the patient. You'll fail if you cause the patient pain. You won't fail if you don't get the very accurate exact diagnosis as long as you've followed a systematic process. So just keep that in mind. Keep looking at the patient in between. You, you, are, you can ask them, are you okay? Am I hurting you? Or start with somewhere you know that doesn't hurt first and move on to the painful bit last. Look for crepitus and describe if the lump or swelling you feel is hard, soft, or firm. If it's cystic, this is where your pen torch comes in. Do not forget to transluminate. So you shine the torch very close to one end. You don't need the rolled up x-ray um, sheet to look through from the other side. You can roughly tell when you shine the light on. I tend to use an otoscope most of the time in my clinic. And I don't need an ultrasound to then tell me that this is a cystic lesion because if it's light shining through, it's got to be fluid. And these are little things that demonstrate your, um, that you're someone who does this in your regular practice in the exam. Um, when you see an MCP joint that's subluxed, check is it dislocated? Is it, uh, is it um, are the deformities that you see correctable? So are they stiff? Do they move at all? Or are they fixed deformities that don't move? Um, and in all these situations, just be very aware that you're not meant to hurt the patient. Um, look for Dupuytren's cords or Dupuytren's disease. Uh, and in Dupuytren's disease, we've talked about pits and nodules, but you can see cords along the um, fingers and describe them. You need to know roughly what are the normal structures and what structures then become cords, like your central cord, your spiral cord, your notatory cords. So those are important terminologies that you need to be able to say in the exam. On the field side, um, in any nerve exam, whatever you get, plexus, median nerve, ulnar nerve, start with sensation. Once you've delineated the area that has a sensory deficit, you're almost really able to say where the problem is, and then you focus on the motor examination for that dermatome or for that nerve. So you should be clear of uh, the area support supplied by the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, and the radial nerve uh, for your exam. Movement, like in the knee and the hip, um, don't forget to do active and then passive. And then check if the range of movement is painful. Is it symmetrical? Because you've got two hands, you can check on both sides and follow a sequence, for example, the wrist, radial dorsiflexion, palm flexion, radial ulnar deviation, pronosupination, then move on to the fingers and thumbs and don't forget to check the tenodesis effect. So this is a sequence that I would do um, because we're in lockdown, we've done this outside with one of my relatives. We've just done this outdoors and I hope this place, but this is your sequence for the exam when you could do a dorsiflexion palm flexion, and then elbows tucked in, you do pronation and supination,
just making sure that the elbow is always tucked in. And then it's your radial and ulnar deviation. And the way I do it is get them to do that and say, move the wrist away from you and towards you. And when you get pain in radial deviation, you can get, it's, it's a pointed towards some radial side of pathology, moving towards the ulnar side, you've got ulnar side of pathology, or maybe ulnar impaction, TFCC tears, et cetera. So these are little screening tools that you can do in someone with a painful wrist. And then moving on. So tenodesis test is good for looking at flexor or extensor tendon injuries. So the when you flex the wrist, the fingers extend. And when you extend the wrist, the fingers flex. So look for the normal cascade of the fall of the fingers and just make sure that one finger is not sticking out while the others are flex down and that would imply there's a flexor tendon injury or in the reverse when you do that and instead of sticking up one of the fingers is sticking down you know there's an extensor tendon injury and these are very good initial screening tests that can tell you there's no tendon problem and move on to the next step so when you're examining muscle please use the mrc grade if you can zero is no movement one is flicker two is with gravity eliminated, three is against gravity, four is full range of movement, but reduced power. And you only know that if you examine the opposite side, five is full power against resistance. There is no one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus, or five plus. It's single digit numbers. A lot of candidates come to the exam and say, oh, it's one plus. There is no one plus, it's one, two, three, four, five. It's also good in the upper limb to know the nerve and the, the nerves and the, in, the, my, the muscles innervated by the nerves and which point they, the, they branch out and which muscles are supplied thereon. So if you want to check if it's a pure posterior entrosis or a radial nerve, um, you're going to check for triceps or ECRL or brachioradialis. It'll tell you that it's slightly higher up than a PIN palsy. Similar for the um, median and the, sorry, ulnar and median nerves as well. So it's important to know the branches and the structures of the, of the nerves and where they branch out and what's supplied, say below the elbow, what's supplied below the wrist, etc. cetera. Um, a simple thing would be, for example, in an ulnar nerve to know whether it's above the elbow, below the elbow, or the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve which supplies sensation in this area, if that's intact, it's less likely to be a, um, a distal lesion. It's more likely to be, sorry, it's, it's likely to be coming from higher up. Um, and then your special test, your Tinels, which and um, Phalens. So Phalens originally described the test by uh, the patient bending the elbow to 90 degrees and patient forcing self-flexion of the wrist for about a minute. And that's the, that's the classic phalanx test that's been described. Remember for the ulnar nerve, your Froman's test, where you're trying to pull a piece of paper away from the patient. If the AD ductor is paralyzed when the ulnar nerve's damaged, they recruit the FPL, as you can see on this side, Instead of using the adductors, the patient's using the FPL to hold the, the, the paper down, and that's a positive Froman's test. The Kilo Nevin sign or the OK sign, which is looking at the FDP to the index and the FPL. On the left side, the FDP is working because the DIP joint is bent. FPL is working because the DIP joint of the thumb is bent, and you can test that against resistance. On the right side, both the FDP to the index and the FPL are not working. Hence, you get this flat surface on both sides and that's an abnorm abnormal test. Um, just remember that the lumbricals and the introsia work together to keep the MCP joints bent and the PIP and DIP joints extended. The intraosseous work more on flexing the MCPs and the lumbricals work more 
on extending the PIPs. And that will help your understanding of the next topic, which is a commonly asked question about the claw hand. So why is this an ulnar paradox? And you'd expect that with a higher up lesion, you'd expect more of a deformity. But what you see is that with a higher up lesion, there's less of a deformity. So what happens in a low lesion is that the hyperextension of the MCP joints occurs. And this is because the lumbricals are now paralyzed and they're not flexing the MCPs. As they're not able to flex the MCPs, the extensors cause hyperextension at the MCP joint. Next, at the PIPs, if the... So you have the... Lumbricals usually extend the PIPs and DIP joints. If the FDP is functional, they cause flexion at that joint because they are very powerful. And that's what you see in a low lesion because the FDP branches are coming from higher up. Hence, the FDP is functional and that causes more clawing with a low lesion. In a high lesion, the FTP is paralyzed and hence there's less flexion at the PIP joints and hence less of a clawing. I hope that's clear. So in a high lesion, there's less clawing. In a low lesion, there's more clawing. One of the tests that you use to decide what you're going to do for a claw hand or a, someone with an intrinsic minus hand is a Bouvier's test. So when you have someone with a claw-ish or hyperextended MCPs, what you do is you bend the, the hand down at the MCP and see if the PIP joints straighten up. If they straighten by themselves, it means that the extension mechanism is intact and you can do a static operation like a lasso technique to keep it successful, i.e. they can still extend the fingers as long as you keep the MCP flexed. If, however, when you bend the MCP down, the PIP joints are unable to extend, there's a problem with the dorsal extensors. And you need to do some form of tenodesis procedure or a dynamic procedure using another tendon. Sometimes the FDS of the middle finger is used. Sometimes the extensor tendons are used to tunnel through the intermetacarpal ligaments and dynamically extend the fingers as well. So the Bouvier test is useful in the demonstrating what type of, or deciding what type of procedure you're going to use in a claw correction. Um, next, moving on to test, you have the Elson's test, which is what you do to check for someone with a central slip injury. So it's on the premise that if the central slip is intact, as you try to extend the DIP joint or move it, it's supple because the lateral bands are lax. When the central slip is cut, then the lateral bands are now pulling on the DIP joint very tightly. And hence, the, when you try to move the DIP joint, it feels very stiff. So you flex the PIP joint, resist extension at the middle phalanx, and then examine the DIP joint. So to repeat, if the DIP joint is lax, like in this situation, it means the central slip is intact. If the central slip is ruptured and you repeat that test, as you move the DIP joint, because the lateral bands are now pulling very tightly, it will be stiff. In the rheumatoid hands, one of the tests that you need to be aware of is the Bunnell-Littlet test, test, 
which is checking for intrinsic tightness. And you may need to release the intrinsics to allow better movement of the stiff finger. So what you do is you hyperextend the finger and then check and see how flexible it is at the, MC, at the PIP joint. Then you repeat the test with the MCP joint flexed and see how tight it feels again. If it is lax in extension and tight in flexion, sorry, I'll repeat that. If it's tight in extension and lax in flexion, that's intrinsic tightness. If it's tight in extension and in flexion, that usually implies an added joint contracture. So here, um, we're testing it in extension. So if it's tight in extension, And then when you retest it in flexion, it's a lot lax. That implies that the intrinsics are tight and you need to consider an intrinsic release. Um, I'm sure most all of you know about Finkelstein's test, which was originally described by pulling on the thumb and ulnar deviating the wrist and Eikhoff's maneuver, which is putting the thumb in the palm, fingers around the thumb and ulnar deviating if you get pain in the radial border that usually indicates a um, de Kervin's positive test. More recently, the WHAT test has been described where you hyperflex the wrist, abduct the thumb and resist abduction. And that's shown to be more accurate for diagnosing de Kervin's test, de Kervin's disease. Um, then you go on to finger collateral ligament testing, Kirk Watson's test, which is an important concept to understand because you might be asked to explain it. As the wrist moves from radial deviation to ulnar deviation, the, the scaphoid goes from flexion to extension, and there's also a degree of ulnar translation. If the scapholunate ligament is intact, when you push on the volar side of the scaphoid and move the wrist from radial to ulnar deviation, the intact ligament holds everything in place. If the scaphalunate ligament is torn and you're pushing on the volar border of the scaphoid, at the scaphoid tubercle and moving from radial to ulnar deviation, because the ligament is ruptured, if you look at the middle diagram here, as you move forwards from right radial to ulnar deviation, the scaphoid is no longer restrained by the scaphoid-lunate ligament and goes out of the dorsal cortex and then plops back in. And that's the click that you get in Kirk Watson's test, which you feel with a palpatory finger dorsally on the radius distal to the radius. So the way I do the test, work up the FCR tendon. The first bony prominence you feel is the scaphoid. Put your thumb on the scaphoid and then move your index finger to a point just distal to Lister's tubercle. The point just, listus, just distal to Lister's tubercle is where your scaphalunate ligament lies. Your index finger is palpating. It's not pushing in, it's just palpating. And then you move from radial to ulnar deviation, pushing from volar, feeling on the dorsal to see if you feel a click or the patient experiences a painful click. And you have to do this a few times. It's not one movement. You've got to, you have to do it a few times to be able to feel that click.
you can hold the scaphoid and the lunate in one hand and blot it as well. Same way, if you move to the ulnar border and you can blot the lunate against the triquetrum, that's your blotment test by Regan. Um, you can push the pisiform upwards. And this, these are looking for lunar triquetral ligament injuries or lateral compression test. Um, and one of the tests for looking at the stability of the DRUJ is the Darby test where you ulna deviate the wrist, block the ulna against the radius, holding the radius firm on the radial side. Now you radially deviate the wrist and that tightens up the ulnar carpal ligaments and the ulna should no longer be blottable if the foveal attachment of the TFCC is intact. Axial loading and compression with ulnar deviation as demonstrated here is a way of checking for ulnar impaction syndrome if you have an ulnar positive wrist and the ulna is impacting on the lunate. Um, thumb CMC arthritis, again, remember not to hurt the patient. If you think the patient's in pain, you can always demonstrate this test on the examiner. You reduce the metacarpal back in if it's subluxed, axially load and grind. That's your grind test for CMC arthritis. So, when you get someone like this, you need to have a good idea of the basics of the Swanson's classification. Is it a failure of formation? Is it duplication? Is it overgrowth? Is it undergrowth? And you need to have a rough idea of which subsection that falls in under. Is it a central deficiency here, which is a cleft hand? Also be aware that more recently, there's a new classification introduced called the OMT, the Oberg, Mansky and Tonkin classification. And this is based on the developmental axis, whether it's a proximal distal problem, an AP problem or a dorsal ventral problem. And they're broadly classified into malformations, deformations, dysplasias and syndromes. I don't think you need to know this in depth, but just be aware that this is the broad classification system that's newly been introduced, but if you stick to the Swansons, that's fine as well. So for someone with that sort of a problem, think simple things you need to do. This is where you need your um, pen, your key, your coin, and you're looking to see testing the grip. This can buy you time. So this is a functional assessment of the patient. And a lot of the patients with congenital deformities are are able to manage with a lot of day-to-day -day activities and don't need any surgical input because there are things that can go wrong with surgery and you may take away some of the function that they've already adapted to. So get them to hold a bag, write with a pen, hold a turn a key. And these are simple things that will take two or three minutes of your time but can help you speak about the fact that the patient is functionally able to manage and hence you may just want to observe him and not do anything surgically. And that's the cylinder grasp. So again, moving on to rheumatoid hand, which is fairly common in the exams and people get worried about what to do in a rheumatoid hand. Describe what you see and the examiner may then say for in this example, focus on the ring finger or focus on the little finger because they're two different deformities or they may want you to focus on the whole on the wrist. So just be aware of the two types of uh, problems, the swan neck, which the origin is in the volar plate of the PIP joint and the boutonniere where the origin is on the dorsum of the PIP joint with stretching of the central slip. So if you have rheumatoid hands for the clinical side, what you need to be aware is there's these four types, broad types from Nalabuff, which is synovitis, it's inflamed, but there's no deformity, which you're unlikely to get. Synovitis with a deformity, there's a swan neck, but it's correctable. 
So you can correct this one neck easily and it's not that painful. Next step, you get the deformity that's fixed, i.e. you've got a swan neck that you're finding it difficult to reduce, but when you ask for the x-ray, there's no joint changes. Or you've reached a stage where there's significant articular disruption and you're, you're now moving into salvage territory, maybe a fusion, or if it's a reasonable stage where you've got movement, uh, you might think you might be wanting to think about joint replacements. So one, two, and three, it's mainly soft tissue procedures, and four, you're thinking about joint replacements or joint fusions. And you're asking yourself, one, is there intrinsic tightness? I've done the Paul Bonnell test, does it feel tight? I'm moving the joint, does it feel stiff or supple? As I move the joint, do I feel like it's out of joint and I'm moving it back in? So in addition to the ulnar drift of the fingers, is the MCP joint completely dislocated or is it just subluxed? And you always say that you wanna have a look at the x-rays to assess the degree of joint damage. Don't forget to look for the function of the tendons. You can get in rheumatoid, you can get drop fingers. And that's a, that's a very good clinical test, clinical case where you can, you need to be able to demonstrate that A, there's no nerve problem. So you do a tenodesis test. You can say the tendons are intact. You can assess individual tendon function. You can test sensory function and you can test motor function. Um, you get the one Jackson syndrome in rheumatoid hands. So always make sure that you examine the tendons. Some of the rheumatoid patients may have added carpal tunnel syndrome. So as your bell is about to ring, don't forget to say, I will complete my examination with a neurovascular assessment or neurovascular and tendon assessment. Just to sum up um, two things, two, three things, just to, so people always ask, what's an intrinsic minus hand? It's when the intrinsics are paralyzed the extensors are hyperactive, the flexors are active, that's your claw hand. Intrinsic plus is what you get when everything's tight. So the intrinsics are very tight. So it's gone into bringing the MCPs into flexion and the PIPs into extension. A lumbrical plus is what you see when you get, when in, when you get terminalizations or amputations and the FDP tendons cut and that pulls back on the um, lumbricals, which are attached to the extensors. So as the patient tries to make a fist, the stump actually extends. So that's a lumbrical plus finger. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, any questions? Thank you, Philip. That was a very comprehensive presentation. You've covered almost the entire gamut of hand examination. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Is it audible? Is it audible now? Philip, can you hear me? I can now, got it. Okay. So thanks for the brilliant presentation. You have, uh, I mean, this is very comprehensive and cover almost the entire hand exam spectrum. A uh, couple of questions that have come up. One is uh, the uh, test for lunotricultural instability. Do you really need to do that for exam? Because it's quite difficult to elicit, right? And the answer is no, you don't need to. Um, and if, if someone's presenting with purely ulnar sided symptoms, and it'll be a harsh examiner who gives you a lunar triquetal instability, but it's, I just put it there for completion sake. So it's, if, you, if the patient's complaining of radial sided symptoms, just focus on the scaphalunate because they're just going to want you to demonstrate those um, signs rather than uh, how to examine the lunar triquetal. But if you do get someone with ulnar-sided pain, you've done your ulnar impaction test, et cetera, and it's, it's, it's for the gold medal, and you want to demonstrate that you know those extra tests. But for the standard 
and sequence no, you don't, you don't need to demonstrate that unless someone specifically asks you. That means if you get to that stage, you're doing really well. Okay. The other one is, uh, don't we need to do the Allen's test to check the patency of the ulnar and radial artery? That is part of the systemic examination of the hand. Um, so let me break that down into two situations. You're in a short case and you're in a long case. So are the intermediate case or the, or the um, short case? In the short cases, unless you're thinking that there is actually a vascular problem, I would expect you to demonstrate a finger Allen's test in someone with revision dupatrons or primary dupatrons. I'd expect you to demonstrate that on the finger and show that as you release it, pinks off. I, I wouldn't ordinarily expect you to do an Allen's test in a short case. But if it's a long, if it's an intermediate case and you've got somebody with a history of trauma and you're concerned there's some features that are suggesting that the fingers are pale, yes, by all means, demonstrate an Allen's test. The, your, if there's no obvious vascular problem, you're losing time to demonstrate other valid tests. If you, it, like, like I was saying initially, you need to figure out, is this a skin problem? Is it a tendon problem? Is it a vascular problem? If you get someone with a hemangioma or if you get someone with, who's got a, um, a, a um, uh, what, sorry, I've forgotten the name. If you get someone with a ganglion that's over the, um, over the volar that's side true. near the radial artery, then yes, I definitely do that. So pick and choose which, how many tests you want to demonstrate to the, to the examiner. If you're out of everything to do and there's nothing else to demonstrate, by all means, yes. Does that help? I mean, I'm assuming that's... Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, perfect. And what are the common uh, exam cases that are kept for, I mean, in general? Say a lot of top five cases that are commonly kept for the exam. Um, the short cases you're most likely to see um, the, for, for the cases you, you're, you, you're unlikely to get anything that's very acute. It's mostly chronic conditions, but you may get someone who's had previous carpal tunnel surgery with a scar, hypothena muscle wasting. You could get somebody who's had previous ulnar nerve surgery with now hypothena wasting, um, claw hands, um, rheumatoids are there are plenty of them floating about. So you, you most likely get one rheumatoid case. It may be somebody with a drop finger, maybe someone with, uh, with um, MCP joint ulnar drift. Uh, it may be someone who's had surgery already, like maybe a wrist replacement, maybe a wrist fusion. So a lot of the post-op ones may come in. So don't be confounded that you're gonna get someone who's completely new some of these patients may have had one or two surgeries already. So don't be worried about scars. So just be aware of the normal scars that are used for wrist fusions, wrist arthroscopies, those, those sort of cases. Um, trigger fingers, they're very common. Dupatrons is very common. I think um, Dupatrons and uh, rheumatoid are the most common ones. Yeah. And you can get them in the short case or the intermediate case because they may ask you to focus on one finger or the whole hand. Okay. And I think the uh, classification that you mentioned, Nalabov, is a quite a good guide to help you with the different stages, isn't it? Yes, of course. So, I mean, I wouldn't get too bogged down with it. It's just those four. If you focus on those four, the, the viva is obviously different from the clinical. I'm just focusing on the clinical side. For the clinical, you just need to be able to demonstrate that you are thinking of those four conditions or for those stages that is the joint supple, so, and you can just say, oh, well, the joint feels supple and it's flexible, um, et cetera. So those are the bits. On the clinical conditions, the other bit that I forgot to mention was scaphoid non-unions, um, chronic scaphoid ligament injuries where you have a clear, clear cut, Kirk Watson's, um, post-traumatic arthritis from wrist fractures. And if you're in some in an area that has a predominant hand and wrist practice, I'm sure you'll get a keen box thrown in at some point. Okay. The other question that has come up is uh, regarding the distal radial joint. The uh, piano. Uh, what are the clinical common clinical abnormalities that you encounter in a DRAJ 
problem? For example, the piano key sign and what else do we need to look into? So again, you, you need to think about two or three things. One is this instability that's coming to you or is it pain or is it both? And you need to factor in the age of the patient. And these are, this is where you, you, you look at the patient holistically. Is it an elderly patient? Is it a young patient? Is it middle-aged? So if you're getting a young patient and they're just complaining of pain in your wrist and, and they're swelling and it's, uh, it's clicking, you're thinking, is that a tendon problem? Is it an ECU tendon problem? Or do they have some form of inflammatory pathology? Because nowadays, those are the groups you see where you get the very young patients who've been on medication, the medication's not working. You don't see the older um, big deformities like you used to before. Um, next, you're thinking about where is the pain localizing to? Is it when you examine, is it in the fovea? Is it a TFCC problem? Is it an ulnocarpal problem? And is that being made worse when you do the ulna impaction test? So then you're thinking, is it all positive? Is it all negative? You go down that route. Is it painful specific, specifically over the DRUJ and it's pain on rotation? So you're thinking of DRUJ arthritis. Again, it's very unlikely that they'll give you somebody with pure DRUJ arthritis. It will be wrist arthritis or rheumatoid with the DRUJ problem like a caput ulna. And if it's caput ulna, then they may take you down the extensor tendon, ruptures, et cetera. Answer to the specific question, if you're looking for DREJ instability, the test I use is what we've, what I've just demonstrated, which is the, with your ulnocarpal ligaments completely relaxed and your hand holding the radial side on one and the examining hand on the ulnar side, you blot the ulnar. And most people it's mobile. When you tighten up the, the ulnocarpal ligaments and it's still mobile, then the most common cause is that you've disrupted the foveal attachment of the TFCC and it's unstable. You can demonstrate the piano key sign. You can get patients to push off and you can, but make sure in all of these, you compare with the opposite side because quite often than not, you may get somebody with a ligamentous laxity and that's normal for them. So just make sure you demonstrate it on the opposite side. And again, if, if the actual side is painful, it may make sense to do the normal side first so you can demonstrate to the examiner, you know how to do the test and not cause the patient pain. And is there a name for this test? Is it a bellotment test or something like that? Um, I've learned it from Derby where I trained at the Pogotov and I've always called it the Derby test. <laughs> okay, so you can call it the Derby test, interesting. Uh, okay, uh, Philip, I think there are no more questions and we've covered the entire spectrum of hand and uh, uh, we look forward for more from your side and thank you for sparing your valuable time with us. I'm sure the candidates are really benefited from this wonderful lecture. My pleasure. Take care. Have a good evening and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Thank